Hi, this is Tavi Greiner, Astronomy.fm's Vice President of Communications. If you enjoy our programming, please let us know with a donation to astronomy.fm slash donate. We really do rely on your support, and it's true. Every little bit counts. AFM. Program complete. Enter when ready. The curtain of night is drawn back. The telescopes are trained. The domes are open. The audience is set. Now, step into the event horizon. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the event horizon here on astronomy.fm radio. It is another Friday evening, and what do we pretend to do, Nick? It's Friday night. We're going to take over the world. Let's <laughs> think you we're going to do that. Sorry. That's right. May 17, 2019, about 9 o'clock in the evening. For those of us in the eastern portion of North America, daylight savings time. Universal time would put it at 1 o'clock in the morning, Saturday morning, May the 18th. Again, 2019. We are live for the next hour. And don't forget, our chat room is ready for you to come on over and join us. That's Stramid.fm. What's up, Nick? Uh... It's a good evening. So in the chat room, there's myself, there's you, Marcy, there's Andre, Glenn, Starstorm, Recon Part 2, and Red Shirt 3. It's, it's a great night. Yes, we're live. And uh, all I can say is, I am Groot. <laughs> yes, Glenn, exactly. So make like a tree and leave. Ah, uh, this tree doesn't leave. This tree uh, uses a blaster. <laughs> But, uh, uh, it's, full, it's, full mooners tonight, yeah, like ninety nine percent full stuff. Yeah, technically not till like five o'clock in the afternoon for us tomorrow, and then you know it's still going to be another eight hours sure. before uh, <laughs> it gets dark. You can actually see it here, so that yeah, close enough. And where is that? Yeah, place? it's uh, it's a good evening. I'm, I'm actually enjoying the self, enjoying this evening. I can't see the moon tonight, obviously. I'm in New York. It is cloudy. It is it's cloud central. Yeah, a bunch of clouds. Moon's into uh, the constellation of Libra, by the way, tonight. Ooh. Just kind of let you know. So. It's balancing out. Hi, hi. That yeah, is getting into that uh, Milky Way, Milky Way region. Which look at it, uh, a couple of things like uh, Jupiter is, Jupiter is almost near the center of the Milky Way. So you know what all that means? You know what it means when the yeah, the Milky Way is a snack you can eat without ruining your appetite. <laughs> <laughs> leave the cringe humor for ghosts. I've been told to leave the green, the cringe humor for ghosts. Um, okay. If you're British, you remember horrible histories on the BBC. Their latest production is a show about a series of ghosts in a stately home and how they deal with a new um, chav owner. Does it involve a wishing well? No, actually it doesn't. Um, uh. It's just a series of ghosts from the past of the, sh- past of the house. But uh, there's been some solar action, I know that much. Uh, Ten metres has been hopping. Uh, in fact, one of my friends actually worked Guatemala on six metres of the magic band. 50 megahertz. Oh. So, and you can only do that really when you've had enough that will see me come through right now and really kickstart the men, give the magnetic field of the earth a really good kick. So it is starting to show up in radio then because I, I noticed that, uh, well, the, the sensors are, are, we did not get hit by the storm we thought we were getting hit by. So maybe there's still a little bit more coming up, but uh, so far the, the stuff didn't really hit us as much as they were. We're thinking it might. Solar wind speeds right now are, are 393 kilometers per second, but the density is still pretty low at only 1.7 protons per cubic centimeter. So it might be a little activity, but not as much as they were thinking or hoping, hoping for. Well, as I say, um, right now, if you're on the radio, and I mean radio waves, uh, 80 to 40 meters is fair by day and good by night. 30 to 20 meters is fair, fair. Um, uh, there is no auroral reports and the aurora bands are closed. But having said that, though, um, people were, what is a hertz? Well, a hertz is a cycle, one cycle per second. It's a measurement of frequency, Glenn. So 
kind of kind of like the power lines are at sixty hertz, so yeah. we get a a a a spike and a trough every sixtieth one sixtieth of a second. So that's sixty hertz. Yes, of our electrical grid. Well, the radio waves are basically have the same same type of thing. So yeah. Uh, basically, it was the red. It was aimed, named in honor of the person who actually discovered uh, what was going on with radio waves. So, yeah, that's correct. Then sixty cycles per second. If you're if you're old like me, uh, I, I still work in mega cycles, killer cycles. So, for instance, I like working in motorcycles. I know you like motorcycles, Marty. I, if I'm going to get a motorbike, I'm going to get a Norton Commando 850 in, in, in silver and black. Okay. Um, that that is a great bike to have. But uh, so basically, the U.S. power grid has a frequency of sixty cycles or sixty hertz per second. In the U.K. and most of Europe, it's fifty hertz or fifty cycles a second. Mm-hmm. Um, so looking at some of the frequencies I I play with, so one hundred and forty four megahertz, which is a two meter band, is one hundred and forty four mega cycles, millions of cycles per second. scary okay. huh? got it yeah that's just a number sometimes uh, and, and, of, and of course thank you ratio three i always have do good do, i always do have good taste in motorbikes <laughs> um <laughs> but uh let's so say the magic which is six meters is 50 megahertz um so ac yes ac is different from dc ac is alternating current so you go from zero you go to a peak you go back to zero you go down to a negative and come back up to zero mm-hmm. That's all alternating current. DC what? is direct current, and it's a flat line measurement. Yep, it's it's constant voltage yeah. in DC. Constant. Yep. Uh, so the sun, by the way, yeah, we're just losing that active region uh, twenty seven forty one. Uh, still looks like it's kind of flaring a bit, but it's getting right to the right to the limb of the sun right now, the western sky limb. So just getting ready to rotate away. But this is a great time to look at the sun through hydrogen alpha telescopes. Um, that's um, a one single frequency, basically, of, of red light produced by ionized hydrogen. And it allows you a telescope that will pick up that one line. It will allow you to see some extra features on the sun, like prominences on off the edge and solar flare. So that sunspot region and active region underneath it is getting right to the edge so if it has any good prominences they'll be visible within the next couple of days on the western limb of the sun so if you got that type of telescope or filter uh this is a good time to look for it next two to three days and check out that limb sunspots going away we're going to go back to a blank spot so we'll see what happens in two weeks when that same active region goes all the way around the back and if it comes back out again uh, maybe we'll get something. We'll get something good. There was two sunspots. One of them basically broke up right in front of us. That was the one that was been really big for two months, and it broke up. And then one trailing it behind it, starting to pick up, and that's the one that's just rotating away. So we got a chance for this one good spot to come on back around, but it's going to be two weeks before we find out for sure. But as I say, it's, it's always quite interesting because everybody goes on about, oh, we're in a solar minimum. Yeah, big deal. Um, we have a variable star. Um, it's not an extremely variable star, thank all the gods, mm-hmm. but um, it is variable enough, even in solar minimum, that it can kick off some interesting CMEs and solar flares. The interesting thing was the the flares um, came off an old sunspot group. This yes. uh, this group had been around the around the sun a couple of times already, and it still it was still very very active. So, of course, the F1, F2 layers during day and night were going to be get a, a nice kick in the pants, so to speak, which means we're going to get a lot of shortwave work. And uh, everybody's happy, of course, because everybody's complaining, uh, oh, radio's dead. Yeah, but you just got to wait because it's a variable star. And like most stars, we don't really know the total ins and outs of it yet. Um, I don't think we ever will understand totally, but it's the nice thing is, of course, it means there can be some nice surprises. Of course, during solar maximum, um, some of those nice surprises can be not very nice surprises. And if we have a, a super X class flare, um, it could actually shut down the grid. And um, there was a BBC documentary about it about t- about ten years ago, and it showed the effects of a real super X class flare. 
how in fact that the aurora was seen from pole to equator now in that scenario um basically you are talking about a lot of disruption grids will go down uh, and we don't make the power transformers that quickly so if the whole grid in a country was knocked down to get at one go it would take about possibly they they think between five to ten years to get the whole country back on the grid now that's yeah. the worst case scenario well, it's not but, the grid that goes down it's overloading the transformers having them yeah, basically but it blow pulls up the grid down short out yep. well that does that too yeah what it was what happens is um you get uh, uh, you get magnetic loops in the ground itself uh, and th that is what actually destroys the transformers they they can sh the only way they have really a protecting the grid in this situation is to shut it down um right. and that, that is a, a that is a politician's worst nightmare mm -hmm. um think shutting down the power to a city like, like new york city or washington dc or something just to protect the power grid um from solar sort of flare the other thing, of course, if you, you're getting aurora pole to pole, you're also probably getting radiation sickness following it because it means that there's a heck of a lot of stuff leaking through the Van Allen belts um, and getting through to us on Earth. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that means a lot of flights will be grounded until it's safe to fly again. Yeah. Um, the interest That's usually is, used a few days, though. That's yeah, so normally so a few days. They found that the worst areas to be flying in during a real solid solar storm is the polar routes because that is where the radiation can get that's where the magnetic field is at its weakest and it right. gets through it's a magnetic polar region well yeah but so, if follow, you think so it follows those field lines the energy follows yeah. those field lines and gets pulled down through the atmosphere well redshirt three is pointing out in the chat room they used to work in it for a nuclear power plant and whenever there was a flare they would get a solar magnetic disturbance alert to watch out for straight currents <laughs> Um, now, think, and they said the plant, the actual plant itself, was located over an iron deposit, which would have made things even worse. Hi, Uptronics. Welcome to the show. We're live tonight, and we're having a bit of fun with the sun. <laughs> <laughs> so, Just, so yeah, the, the the thing about you know shutting shutting the grid down on purpose before there's damage. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. The question is like, well, what if you shut it down and it turns out it wasn't going to be such a big event? Or, you know, and then you've disrupted a lot of power to a lot of people. Or what if you take the chance and don't shut down, it becomes worse, and then really zap things out even more. So uh, yeah. I think if we could just get the public used to a grid shutting down for a short period of time and then, you know, back up again, uh, I think, yeah, a little bit of public training would be really yeah. useful, kind of like a fire drill or, or you know, major emergency uh, uh, hurricane type of testing drills and stuff like that. Uh, then it would be a lot easier to go ahead and shut the grid down for a day or something like that and then bring it back up and everybody could get an idea of how that works. I think that should be done as part of an emergency prepared, preparedness well, thing. Well, a lot of already amateurs actually plan for that. Um, they may have a mobile radio unit they can put into uh, a Faraday box, which is simply just a metal box mm -hmm. with, no, with no holes in it. So that way, worst, the worst case scenario is, okay, most people's computers have been uh, completely and utterly zapped. Um, if most, maybe most mo mobile phones will be zapped, so you want, you want to think ahead. You put a transceiver, you put a, a mobile phone, a spare phone, even if it's one of the old Gibbs style flip phones in, into a metal box, keep it closed. You have a you have one of these solar flares, then you open it up and use it. Now, mm -hmm. of course, me, um, I'm I'm always prepared because uh, my 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 actual transceiver has valve finals, which means it's actually EM technically EMP proof. Well, yeah, I, the, the, yeah the, the, well, the radio amateurs are one thing, but the general public especially some of them that, you know, go into a meltdown panic attack when their phone goes out. Yeah. Uh, you know, they don't know about that and they can't handle that. So that's the people that you basically have to train for when, you know, a power grid could go down uh, and what they should do and things like that. Uh, if you think, think about it this way, it, it's like when you've had, you know, if you live in the Northeast or maybe, across the, the, the top of the North America towards Michigan, you mm -hmm. get an ice storm, okay? We have a really bad ice storm. 
the cables come down, the poles come down, and everybody has to live for two to three days without power. Mm -hmm. Or weeks. It, it, or weeks. It happens on a regular basis in the winter here in the United States. Um, but people get around it. Either they have a generator or they go into perhaps a sports arena where they've got generators running to provide heating, to provide lights, um, and to provide amenities. So you can actually live and survive until your power company reconnects you. It, mm -hmm. It's kind of that situation. We deal with it here in the northeast of the United States, here in upstate New York um, and up to the Canadian border. Losing your power in the winter is a regular occurrence. Um, the other, thing, the so other thing about losing think. your power, the good, bad about losing your power in the wintertime is you can still keep your food cold, but yeah. bad thing is you can't warm yourself up very well. Well, there's always cool things like having camping stoves. Uh, if you're I mean, I mean your house. Your house. Hey, I, I know people that use their gas cooker. They, they lit the oven in the, and run, run the gas rings. Yeah, dangerous. Because... It's dangerous, but people did it. They kept warm. Mm -hmm. Or you have a wood burner in the basement or something so that come the winter and you know you're going to lose power for a few days, you go downstairs into the basement, you fire up the wood burner, and everything's hunky-dory. Mm -hmm. If you have that, like I live in an apartment. There's no way I'm going to you know, build a fire in the <laughs> middle of this place. You know? yeah, Not you happening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But that, that's, why they, that's why they have emergency centers. That's why they tell people to move, to come down to this location where we can provide you with warmth and food. Mm -hmm. Well, let's hope the grid doesn't go down or, or if we get actually people semi-used to the grid going down and trained for it, uh, emergency prepared there, and stuff. That would be... There is a, a show done by the BBC. It's called Connections. It's the very first show James Burke did in the series, um, and he, put, he went back to when Niagara A went offline. There was an overload, the failsafe kicked in, and it, sh it, bl it, put, it plunged most of the northeast into, into, into darkness. Mm -hmm. And it does happen. Yep. And, of course, uh, it, was, it was a warm hazy summer weekend or week when that happened and there was no good astronomy you think you know if all the lights go out for about a thousand square mile or more area you'd have some really nice astronomy no the haze has to kick in and ruin all of it yep. now we have a question in the chat room all right what's now, your question in the chat room do black do black holes have magnetic fields yes they do they're in the they are actually in the um, inter they interplay around the outside of the event horizon, and you can see it as a, as the accretion disk. Mm -hmm. That is a, that is considered to be magnetically tangled, and possibly related to jets coming out of the black hole. Too. Yep, and some of these actually p provide and, and fuel uh, quasi-stellar objects, aka quasars. Mm -hmm. Well, that was um, that was that image of the black hole in M87. They yeah. basically <laughs> image uh, particles moving around the uh, around the um, the black hole and also while well, they, they've known about that jet that comes out of it for a long time too. In fact, I'm looking at Redshirt 3's answers. The black holes have huge magnetic fields. That's what caused the jets wow. uh, perpendicular to the accretion disk. Yes. <laughs> it used to be <laughs> used to have thought it was uh, was it conservational momentum that caused the jet to come out of a momentum, pole, but yes. now they they figured out it's actually magnetic fields that does it. So. it it's actually the, the gases and material heating up. The accretion disk is glowing literally because the particles are heating up and they yeah. become visible Colliding. to it. Yep. Yeah. Colliding and the magnetic fields do this do it too. So yep, they have huge magnetic fields. And, of course, I guess if somebody was to go through that magnetic field, they'd probably get zapped so much they'd glow themselves, they'd be dead, before they even got to the point of being spaghettified. Leave the car jokes for the commercials. Hello? Yeah. I'll hear you there. Oh, I'm still here, yeah. Oh, okay, good. 
I'm being told to leave the car jokes to the commercials. Leave the lights. Uh, here in the Northeast, we have we have a car dealer that's from New York to Florida, and his catchphrase is, it's huge. Eddie, that doesn't tell you that's not <laughs> giving your license to say it more. <laughs> Sorry, Starstorm's getting wound up because of uh, it. Yes, conservation uh, energy. Uh, a couple of moon things. Uh, the shrinking moon. Yeah, been, I saw that. Been in the news lately. Yeah, so they've uh, they've calculated that uh, the moon is shrinking a little bit, and they've also detected some uh, moonquakes. Well, they've been mm -hmm. detecting moonquakes for a long time, ever since they put the seismograph there back in the uh, '70s, uh, when the lunar missions were there so they've been detecting moonquakes and they've also had evidence that the moon actually shrinks a whopping 150 miles every several million years uh, well anyways they've um they've seen some well i think it's through lro has actually seen uh places where with because the, the shrinking of the moon has kind of disrupted the surface of the moon a little bit so they can kind of see some kind of frozen dirt ripples in the surface yeah. of the moon that was Related into uh, into its shrinking down a little bit. Not necessarily, it'll shrink a little bit more, but it's not like shrinking, shrinking, not like the incredible shrinking man, where it's going to get really, really small. It's just basically compacting down and kind of break, you know, brittle surface features kind of crush down a little bit. So a little, still a little bit of, you know, changing surface features on the moon, but not a lot and not happening very quickly either. Here, here, here's a link for the for the lunar thing. Okay. Um, I I actually have this. I actually had this on my Facebook, which is why it's so humongously large. Okay. Um, yeah, and related works, to related to the moon, the LRO has actually spotted the uh, space IL bear sheet lander impact area. Mm -hmm. So the Israeli company space probe that was trying to land softly. Uh, on the moon that didn't have a success at that so they've actually they actually can see the impact zone no glenn no one has actually said glenn shut up actually it's quite nice we love you asking questions and set, making comments in the chat room if you're not in the chat room folks um when we're live you're missing out on all the good fun actually um people are talking about what we're talking about people are asking questions so if you really want a chance to ask a question of me and marty but either answer to be answered tonight or maybe next week, um, come into the chat room now. Right. Uh, so nope, I, nope, I nope. put nobody, nobody said shut up to anybody. No, we don't. Or did, or did, or did uh, uh, Starstorm tell you to shut up or something? She was telling me to shut up. There you go. Car jokes. There you go. Um, and, and for the, the group comments. <laughs> the I am group actual group i will save the i am groups for actual group now the th so study finds new wrinkles on the moon it's around the area of mare frigoris and this is a mosaic composed from images taken by the lro now the really great thing about this is a little probe that is doing so well um let's face it this is science on the cheap folks what um, probe is this lro oh lro got it Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Got it. Yeah. If, if you really, really think about it, um, this was supposed to be a short-term quest, uh, short-term mission. It's kind of like some of the, the Martian robots. Um, it, it, it keeps giving and giving and giving. Mm -hmm. um, as you pointed out, it spotted the impact crater from the Israeli lander. It spotted its image the Apollo landing sites, mm -hmm. um, and so also, so did, it wasn't a fake. yeah, exactly. As Starstein points out, it put, it shows that the moon landings really did happen. They're not faked. This isn't the film Capricorn one. Um, this is reality. We placed experiments on the lunar surface. We, placed people on we the put lunar people surface. there. Um, and, and I think you must be a really sad person. If you really, really think, this is, this is all just a cheap stunt by the government to divert attention from other things. Uh, I'm sorry, folks. The Apollo program did what no 
other program could do. When you think about the amount of people that Mercury, Gemini and Apollo put back into work and the money generated for the government in, in income tax alone, they had people who worked in the garment district in New York um, making gloves. Um, it and people back to work. Yeah, it, it, it kick started the economy. The economy was in the doldrums at the time. You, there was a ho hugely unpopular war. The economy was really dragging and people were not in work. Then we have Mercury, Gemini and Apollo. And suddenly people are being put back to work. Doing what they do best. Doing what they do best. You have people who were normally stitching um, bras for women together, making space suit gloves to be used for EVAs and, and, and on the moon. Um, yeah, LR, MRO has completed 50,000 orbits. It's still going strong. Okay, Glenn, I saw, I, I saw your message. Fair enough. Um, but as I say, this is what we're paying for. This is the good return we're getting. Now, I, I realize that there's a lot of talk about going back to the moon, about um, orbital transfer stations. Uh, actually, it's 60,000, according to NASA. Um, so according to Red Shirt 3, some of the gloves were actually made near him in Delaware. It put an awful lot of people back to work. It created jobs. It and made people feel so good. And now they're talking about going back to the moon again. So, well, that, but that's kind of, it's it's almost sort of like before, but for different reasons and more of a political thing than anything else. So, well, maybe the next election, that plan will change. So we'll see. We have a lot, a lot of NASA publications are about, we're going back to the moon. We're committing to do this. We're trying to do that. We're doing, 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 doing. It's like, well, yeah, that's right now, but. They're also saying, well, we're asking for money to do this, too. So it doesn't mean they've got the money to do this. The, the ironic thing is, when you look at your tax, what you, get, what you give the government on income tax, pennies go to NASA. Literally mm -hmm. pennies. Yep. It, it, if, if, it was, if they were saying, well, $10 of your income tax is going to NASA, hey, that's fine. Do it. Let's do it. Think, you know. think of the budget NASA would have. Think of what they could do. Think of the missions they could, the manned missions they could run. They, they could bring forward, return to the moon even quicker. They could go to Mars. We could go to the asteroid belt. I would be happy if I could uh, actually de you know, decide which part of my taxes went to NASA, too. I would really prefer that. But you know what? We have these grand plans, but... Washington does not fund them. They want to do this. They want to do that. NASA's got to do this. NASA's got to do that. Then give them the then give, funding. Wow. I hope you can't. I don't know if you can hear what Starston was saying. She was getting really worked up. Give them the funds to do it. Um, we waste so much on um, politicians doing fact-finding missions to countries X, Y, and Z. Forget that. Let's give the money to NASA. NASA, you want to do this? Here's the funds. Do it. Be done with it. Take away all these fact-finding missions abroad. Um, make the politicians pay for their own trips abroad. <laughs> they I want to go they, on a fact. I think I think they should do fact-finding missions to the moon. That's what I that, think. Yeah, that's hey, that's one way to get the funding. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Let's all right. <laughs> on that on that note, we're gonna we're halfway through our program already, so we'll do a little station identification. You're listening to the event horizon here on astronomy.fm radio. It is another Friday evening, and this one is May the 17th. 2019, about 9.30 in the evening, about halfway through our program. Uh, Universal Time would put it at about uh, 1.30 in the morning, May the 18th, Saturday morning, again, 2019. So we still have another half hour of live programming coming up. And don't forget, join us in our chat room if you want to be part of this part of this conversation during our live presentation. We will repeat this program with more programming for the next four hours, every four, 24 hours. I, sh I should say every four hours for the next 24 hours. So you might be catching us on uh, one of the repeat times if that's more convenient for you. Or 
you can go to youtube.com, put in the event horizon. You can listen to the sh you can listen to me and Marty. You can mm -hmm. get the links that you missed because you weren't in the chat room, and uh, you can follow along. Hey, guess what? Mars twenty twenty is coming together as well. There you go. Oh, nice. Uh, I like Mars hot missions. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, it's even today's story. There you go. Fresh story today. Mars twenty twenty. All of the press. Um, they're testing parts of Mars 2020. They're testing parts of the rover. They're, you, they're testing from the top down the complete cruise stage, which will power and guide the 2020 spacecraft on its seven month journey. Um, is shown in the picture, and it's shown what is shown directly below it is the aeroshell, black, uh, a white back shell, and it's barely visible black heat shield which will protect the vehicle during cruise as well as its fiery descent um, into the Martian atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Not visible because it's cocoon inside the aerial shell is the complete rocket power descent stage and the surrogate rover. Obviously, they're not, they're, when they're testing stuff here on Earth, they're going to use the stand-in. And, of course, the real rover is still going, undergoing final assembly at JPL's High Bay 1 clean room. Uh, I was just looking up uh, what's, what's called... Star, the Starlink mission from mm -hmm. SpaceX. That didn't go, did it? Just looking at their webpage, it still has to, still did not launch yet, correct? It was been delayed a couple times. Yeah, this is, this is, uh, isn't this their internet system using multiple layers of satellites? 60 Starlink satellites are going to go up at yeah. one time. And let's see, the next launch window is targeted for about a week, exact date to be determined. All right, yeah, because it was supposed to go a few days ago. And yeah. then I think it was high level winds that, uh, um, it changed the, the launch date, so now it looks like they're going to um, rework it for about another week or so. So keep tuning they're in. They're also the Starlink. Go ahead. They're also doing that. They they suddenly found they needed to do a, a serious software update, a kernel update. Ah, um, okay. Right. It is much better to do these updates here on the planet mm -hmm. than risk doing an update when it's in space and. You got to do a yeah. reboot, and then you got to hope that. Uh, an well, not just that, that the actual thing wakes up after it's shut down and starts to reboot correctly. Yeah. So, by doing all the really serious software updates whilst it's still on terra firma, um, it's probably a very good idea. Then they can reboot it; they can make sure it works, and then they can put it back into um, the ro or back on top of the rocket, uh, and then send it up. Yep. Yes, that's exactly what Elron says. So that's coming up. Uh, also, well, it's not going to be until June when they launch another mission to the uh, space station. Well, so well, June twenty second will actually be for that launch. So we'll be able to see the uh, the Starlink mission launch before before the, the June real one for space station. Is space has gone from being um, oh, we're never going to make a profit out of it to hey guys, there is actually a profit here. Mm -hmm. um, SpaceX is using its regular Falcon 9s to fund Heavy Falcon and the big freaking rocket. Big Falcon um, rocket. Big Falcon rocket, big freaking rocket. It looks like the Anastasia from Dan Dare to me. I think they've changed but, the name on that anyways. <laughs> but the, the thing is, this guy is thinking big. He's, he's aiming for Mars. He's aiming for a system that once the main system, main rocket has yeah, launched... Cool. It's reusable. And, of course, it can refuel. This is not going to be a very light rocket. This is going to be a very heavy rocket. He's actually using steel in his rockets. For mm -hmm. this, this particular rocket is going to have steel involved. So it's going to be heavy. And he's working on a way to refuel in Earth orbit to perhaps send tankers ahead to Mars. So when it gets there, it can refuel. That means if there's astronauts on board, they have a viable way home. They haven't got to worry about landing, making fuel on the planet, and then hopefully coming back. They will have a viable fuel source waiting for them. They can tank the main spacecraft. They can make sure their lander is fully fueled. They can go down, have a poke around, take some samples, come back. Mm -hmm. So... This is a, a completely different, this is a real game change from the old style of doing a space mission. 
let's go to the moon. Why not? It's a good stepping stone. It's also the best place you've got to test your technology for Mars. It's closer to home. You can mount a rescue mission easier. And if you've got your orbital satellite in place, that means they can send a second lander to go pick up the crew if there's a problem with the original lander. Yep. Potentially. Can you tell we're passionate about this? There you go. <laughs> Stuff in the sky lately. Have you seen Jupiter yet? Uh, I don't know because most uh, every day this week so far it's rains. Yeah, well, Jupiter's actually getting up there in a little bit more reasonable time. So around midnight or so, it's starting to uh, starting to rise. So it's time to do some more uh, Jupiter's moons observations. So let's see. One I usually go to is Project Pluto. That tells you when events that have uh, Jupiter's moons actually happen. So like eclipses and occultations, and transits and the shadow of uh, Jupiter's moons going across the face of the planet. So back to that again, of course, look for, you know, impact sites too. Uh, a couple of supernovas have been reported in a few couple of galaxies re recently. The bright, not real bright, 13th magnitude or so. So I always report the ones that hit that magnitude. Uh, one of them discovered recently uh, in a galaxy designated NGC 5353. Uh, uh, mid to northern hemisphere observers because that uh, 13 hours, well, about 14 hours red right ascension in about uh, 40 degrees latitude. Another one in an um, undesignated galaxy uh, visible more for the southern hemisphere because that one is at like minus 69 degrees and it's uh, right about uh, the 20, 24 hour mark and right ascension. And again, both of them are about Thirteenth um, magnitude, so okay for astrophotographers, visual observers. You know, would have a bit of a time with those. Though. At least there's some supernovas. Most of them are yeah. well. There's like always supernovas. Pretty much every week, there's about ten of them, but they're usually around the sixteenth to nineteenth magnitude. So, thirteenth uh, magnitude, yeah, that's in the astrophotographer range. It's the ones I like to report for everybody. Now, if you like, if you're into Jupiter al almanacs, then here's a link for you. Um, this is from the, there's two very good online ones that I refer to. One is from Astronomy Magazine, made David Iker's beard grow longer. And, of course, the other one is from Sky and Telescope. Now, the Sky and Telescope one is just here. Um, so, as I say, it's, Jupiter is spending its 2018-2019 apparition in Scorpius and Ophenicus. Um, the nice thing is... Virtually any telescope will show you the, the four Galilean satellites. Mm -hmm. And Sky and Telescope uh, actually do have a very good Java program and a red spot calculator. So you can also find predicted times for great red spot transits. So I'll put that into the chat room as well. Just one second. Sounds good. So definitely getting back into uh, easy t easier hours for looking at the planet Jupiter instead of those early mornings that we've had several months yeah. ago. Basically, to use this calculator, you enter a date. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if I enter this put today's in, so it's month, day, and year. So that's going to be 05, 17, 2019. And click on the calculate button and... Oh, I see. It doesn't like it. It's, I've, it wants to me to put uh, slashes in. Okay, I can do that. I'm so used to writing dates without slashes. It's uh, <laughs> one of those things. So it's going to give you, it's centered on the date of 517 of 19 at uh, 610 UT. And then there's another one at 1606 UT. And on the 18th two, at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, um, universal time. And uh, so, so looking at local dates and times, that switches to uh, 7.10 in the morning, 5.56 p.m. and 3.02 a.m. on the 18th. So it, it's, it's a very interesting thing. You can initialize it um, to today. Uh, it's now coming up as the 18th because my computer's telling it that I'm on universal time. So now it's gone for today. So it's saying that 0201 UT 
again at 11.57 yeah, unit time. Uh, it's called GMT in reality. Uh, or if you're a weatherman, it's, it's, it's Zulu time. Um, and then at 21.53 on the 19th, it doesn't come up yet, but it transfers it over to 3.1 a.m., 12.57 p.m., and 10.53 p.m. I think because I'm on UT, it's assuming that I'm on, I'm on British summertime. But it, it's, a nice, it's a nice little program. Um, apparently, you can get this um, on iPhone and iPad. I have the versions for Android. That's my personal choice. Um, whatever floats your Gyarados. Whatever floats the boat, exactly. There you go. So there you go. If you, if you have any problems, just send them an email to help at uh, skylandtelescope.com. Mm -hmm. uh, coming up on May 22nd, for observers in South Africa and most of Australia, except for G'day. Northwest Australia, uh, be an occultation of Saturn by the moon. Uh, for, for Australia, that's going to be a daytime event. And for South Africa, that'll be a nighttime event. And that is May the 22nd. The only places in the world you can see. I've seen a nice looking, nice one. You could see uh, planetary occultations by the moon. Not that rare, but you have to really, you know, remember to look for them, and, and hopefully your weather will cooperate too. So. Uh, meteors. What's coming up with meteor showers? Let's see. Not a whole lot of meteor showers. Just some, some minor ones. Let's see. We're already. Uh, well, we're past the. At Aquarius, we're pet. Oh, we got a couple in June here. June third, Tau Hercules. Mm -hmm. That's coming up. Another well, it's going to be a couple more weeks for those. For those, and then um, June eighth, we got a couple. The June Mu M U is I think it's pronounced me actually. Cassiopeids. Obviously, that's going to be a northern hemisphere one. And June eighth, also the Eritids. Was, that must be Aries the Ram. So that would be a uh, equatorial one. So pretty much good for the whole well, world. I'm showing January of this year was the, the Quadradrids, April 23rd, the Lyrids, May 5th, Eta Aquarius, late July, Delta Aquarius. Those are the major ones, yeah. I was pointing out the, the minor ones that are occurring mm. within the next few weeks or so. So some minor meteor showers, but. Nothing really great. And, of course, there's always a, a big meteor that flies through the atmosphere sometime unexpectedly and all around the world. So uh, lots, of re lots of reports of those, at least once a month or so. There's yeah, one around the world. Yeah, the nice that's true. Yeah. Oh, oh by land. the way, yes? um, Comet Watch. Comet Watch is being recorded this weekend. Okay. Uh, we, we have a guest from Mount Lemon Observatory. All right, we are lacking back to lacking in comments again. Everything's every comment's really faint, you know. Okay, let's go to comments. Uh, it's pulling up my favorite website. Which, which one is, is yours? Uh, I use the BAA comment section site. All right. This is the I one got, we use. This is the one we use for Comet Watch. So I've what got, have we got here? I got two of them: weekly information about bright comets and comet chasing. The two sites that I use. Yeah. So, Panstars 2017 T2, magnitude 10.5, Assassin 2018 N2, 13th magnitude, uh, Panstars 2016 R2, 13th magnitude, uh, oh, 29P, Swackman, Wackman 1, <laughs> 13th, 13th magnitude, question mark, it's a very variable one, and it's currently at poor elongation, that is Always a good one to watch for. Yeah, it looks like they're all at best about 12, 13 magnitude. So yeah. nothing good in the sky right now. So hopefully we'll get one of those newcomers coming in sometime and uh, have a potential of something getting close. Well, there's always a periodical one that gets in close to after a while. I just don't see anything coming up right now. So. But this, this, this is one of my favorite sites for comments. Mm -hmm. It's uh, uh, Erith net.net um your cg hang on let me just get that pull that back a bit need to see what i'm just looking at salichi yoshida's page now this is a guy who is one of the top images 
He's up there with Terry, Lovejoy, uh, and a few others of the people I know. And uh, this is a website we all use. This is a site to bookmark for comics because he has some really, really good um, information. Uh, he's talking about 78p Geralt's 2, um, N2 Assassin, 2016 M1 Pan Stars. Oh, that's that's that was up to 7.7 .7 in June of last year. And there's a lot of information there on his website. Um, 78p Geralt's 2 is currently not visible or observable. It will be back in the morning sky around the th around 13 to 14th mag in August. But this guy has a lot of data um, about the comets in a very interesting format. Uh, he's got uh, Iomoto Y1, M4 Atlas, 29P, 123P West Hartley, R3 Lemon, which is 13.4 as of the 10th of May. Um, it's brightened up to between 13th and 14th magnitude between from May to June. It is very low in the Northern Hemisphere. It is not observable in the Southern, in the southern Hemisphere either. Mm. So there's a, there's a lot of interesting stuff out there mm. in, if you know where to go look for it. Now, one to put in your diaries um, is C2018W2 Africano. It's expected, and I use the word expected, um, to brighten up to 10th magnitude in the autumn. It's currently at about 15.1 as of May the 5th, and Thomas Lehman. Um, in the Northern Hemisphere, it stays observable for a long time because the comet is brightening. It is not going to be seen in the Southern Hemisphere until mid-September. So, um, as I say, there are a few out there. Um, and there's the, the, quite a few are being kept an eye on. Uh, mm -hmm. 2016 R2 Pan Stars is currently 15.9 mag. It is fading. It's in good condition. It can be seen in good conditions in the Northern Hemisphere. And it stays extremely low in the Southern Hemisphere. So, yeah, at the moment, we are talking beyond 10th magnitude. If, you're, if you have a very good telescope and you have a CCD, you will get it. You should be able to get it with a DSLR too. Um, one of, this might be of interest, it is hardly observable in the Northern Hemisphere though. It is A27, A2017 U7. It's an asteroid. But it's an asteroid that's frightening rapidly. So, <laughs> yeah, nice one. I'm being said a, a, a cartoon by Starstorm. Um, so that is something to keep your eyes from. If you have access to eye telescope, etc., um, you may be able to image it through the southern observ southern hemisphere observatories. I'm uh, looking at this. Um, I'm saying about three twenty three is the best time. Uh, so it's R A twenty two twenty six point three eight. At declination minus thirty six fifty nine point seven. So, if you, if you can see it, go for it. We got an interesting uh, event on one of Jupiter's moons tonight at four hours and three minutes universal time. So that would be like midnight plus three minutes for us. Ganymede, the third third moon, will come out of the shadow of Jupiter, and then one minute later disappear behind Jupiter. So you'll be able to see that moon for one minute at mm -hmm. four oh three universal time. So I don't think Jupiter will be yeah, Jupiter might be up uh real close to being up by then for us. But obviously like people in the UK a little farther towards our our east would be uh much better uh time to be able to see well, that's to be about four in the morning for you. So but that'll be an interesting one. See uh one of the moons appear next to Jupiter and only be there for a minute. And then disappear behind it. Those are the fun ones to see. Yep. Well, but it's not something you could let somebody else look through your telescope and watch because you'll miss it yourself. That's why you record it on a video camera, Martin. Well, there you go. That too. Yeah. For your laptop screen. Yep. Everybody gets to see it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there are there are some decent comments out there, but well, yeah, decent defined. Be... 
decent. You know, you might like the comet, but it's not going to be visible. Well, okay. So for me, decent is anything down to about mag sixteen. That's a decent comet to me. I don't call them well, photographically, maybe, but visually, <laughs> no. Tenth I know, Marty. Is, tenth magnitude is getting too dim visually for the most part. Mm-hmm. Lots of scope because they always appear. Even you know, they might be a tenth magnitude uh, comet, but it looks like a twelfth magnitude object, and so you have to have a pretty big telescope in order to be able to see it because so, the light spread out so much that uh, it's not that bright if you so really want a challenge please. Marty there's the 260p two, two, McNaught I don't, want anything, magnitude. I don't want anything challenging I want it easy to see that's the whole point oh well let's see how's our chat doing anybody there got questions Oh, they're talking about telescopes in there. Um, yeah, telescopes are a good thing to talk about too. How well, are you on your telescope project? Uh, it's going. I'm. I'm just. Uh, it, it's been so busy with a lot of other issues, uh, work and other things that I, I've had to put a lot of stuff on standby. I haven't bought a piece of radio amateur equipment for two months. That's mm. how bad things have got. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Uh, I know it's not not the show, but I will announce that we will be getting uh, Jerry Hubble back on Space space Pirate sometime real soon about his uh, remote-controlled operated uh, observatory. So uh, keep keep an ear out for announcements for us doing a Jerry Hubble interview. That sounds interesting. I'll listen listen to the rerun. Uh, Most of the the time, Marty, when 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 you were on live, I'm heading to bed. Ah, that's what the repeats are for. <laughs> you go to bed early then. I go to bed around nine, half past nine at night, most nights, um, because I'm up at half past five in the morning. If I'm going to do an imaging run, I pre-program it. Uh, I wait to get the emails to say, hi, Nick, your pictures are here. Uh, um, I'm also trying to get back into learning ACP uh, because it's doing my head in right now, uh, amongst other things. And, of course... Uh, someone has asked me if I would volunteer for my for a radio amateur society, a national society. Uh, so I'm thinking, I'm serious. I'm I'm thinking about it. Does that mean I get to play with the uh, um, radio equipment at Bletchley Park? Yes. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> a big radio radio stream or just radio in general convention coming up. I think is that down in Dayton, Ohio. It's already happened. Is, the Dayton has already got started. The radio, it's this this weekend. That's right. This is Friday, so it's this weekend. Yeah. What do, you know, what, do you, what do you know about that show? Okay, Dayton is a get together uh, for radio amateurs. Basically, what happens is all the latest toys are there, all the new radios, all the gear you want to buy. This is where, if you have any sense, you carry cash so that you don't go mad with the plastic. Because I heard one guy went into, went to Dayton last year, and um, he spent about four thousand dollars on one radio. Sounds reasonable to me. Uh, Ak was asking, "How about building a radio te- a radio telescope?" Actually, that's not a uh, that has been in the back of my mind. Um, yes, I am seriously about serious about touching things at Bletchley Park. Um, basically. It is not beyond amateur astronomers. You need a C-band dish in a lot of cases. Most of the hardware is is readily available. Um, Basically, it's off the shelf. There's a couple of companies that do actually sell radio astronomy equipment, Mm -hmm. uh, mostly to radio amateurs who are interested in it. And you can build a decent radio telescope. You can go to the NASA Project JOV, page and you can build a radio telescope using long wire antennas mm-hmm. um am i yeah basically you all, what, I say you could also join an organization called society of amateur radio astronomers known as mm-hmm. sarah and they should be down at that conference too i'll put the link into our yeah. chat room this just to let uh, red shirt three know the national radio um station is at bletchley park uh, the royal society of the radio society of great britain has a major radio station, and at the moment they're just ironing the bugs out of the satellite, the satcom section of it. 
So they have about four or five different radios. They have the history of radio. Um, as in regards to amateur radio, they have early radio, spark gap sets, the lot. Yes, if you're licensed and you go to the NRC, you can get on the air there uh, and use the RSGB radio station. Uh, and I believe that uh, uh, the Duchess of Cambridge was also recently there um, to open a new exhibit on tele teletype and teleprinters and did some STEM work with some young kids from a local school. So yeah, you can, you can play with the radios there if, you, if you've got a license. Um, and I, they, she, I think some of the stuff she was doing was based around Enigma. So yeah, it, it is very much a hands-on place. And uh, I've been in there a couple of times. Nice thing is, if you're a member of the RSGB and you've got a radio license, you can get in for free. Yeah, there you go. I've been I've been there I've been there three times already. <laughs> free. <laughs> oh, just about two and a half more minutes. Not a whole lot for us to go here. So let's see where we got. Um, mm -hmm. All right. Um, might have been reading this article <laughs> from NASA about uh, blue giants. Have you seen that article? No, I haven't. Ah, okay. Well, they've been discovering about blue giants. A blue giant star is a really, really large star. It's blue because it's super hot. Uh, it's also a star that goes through its nuclear fuel very, very quickly. It doesn't last very long, a couple million years. But what they've really discovered, recently discovered about blue giants is that they're basically rippling. Mm -hmm. So they're pretty, especially as they get you know later in their age, they get kind of unstable. So they're actually be able to detect detect ripples um, in the outer atmospheres of the blue giant stars, which means that there's stuff going up and down inside. They're calling them like gravity waves, where uh, basically the gas is just shifting and, and moving all over inside these giant blue stars just before they go kaboom some of them big enough to well they usually all go supernova link uh, marty put the link in the chat room all right here's just a uh it's, here's one from uh just an abstract from nature so this one's quick it's also on the nasa website too but there's one from just an just the abstract from it from nature yeah Magazine. red shirt three if i could get away with doing doing the event horizon from bletchley park trust me i would <laughs> <laughs> well oh, by the way radio radio is you're listening to astronomy radio not radio astronomy here on astronomy.fm time for us to head on out of here i think you put in well you contact the ship put in a call yeah that's the this is the away time me starstorm and martin the away team. <laughs> I've been having so much fun. This is the away team. Captain Seven, three to beam up. Energize. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank everybody in our chat room tonight. Really appreciate you all being here. Don't forget, more programming come up, and we'll repeat these programs every four hours for the next 24 hours, so stay tuned. If there is a disruption on Sunday. Don't worry about it. We're doing work on the system. That's right. So our radio might be in and out on, on this coming Sunday. Uh, we're doing maintenance. Thanks, everybody. Good night, all. Good night. We hope that you've enjoyed this program from AFM Radio, the broadcast service of Astronomy.fm. This program has been released under Creative Commons license. Please contact us for details. You may find more of our AFM original programs on our website. It's really easy to find us. We are astronomy.fm. You may also find us in the iTunes radio listings near the top of the News Talk section and also as an iTunes podcast selection. We'd love to hear your comments. Please email us at radio at astronomy.fm. Thanks so much for being part of the voice of astronomy around the world and across the known universe. This is astronomy.fm radio. Hi, this is Tavi Greiner, astronomy.fm's vice president of communications. If you enjoy our programming, please let us know with a donation to astronomy.fm slash donate. We really do rely on your support, and it's true. Every little bit counts. AFM. There I was, doing my thing, and all of a sudden, 
Wham! Astronomy right between the eyes.